thank you so much for joining us tonight. You're really welcome to be here. Um, whoever you are, wherever you're watching from, maybe you're a regular at Falkirk Vineyard, or maybe you're just come to check us out. Maybe somebody invited you tonight, or maybe you've just stumbled across this video and you're just watching out of interest. Whatever, whoever, wherever, we're glad that you are here. Tonight, we're going to be looking at the day of Pentecost, which is the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out onto those who followed after and put their trust in Jesus. And I don't know if you know this, but in the church calendar, today is Pentecost Sunday. And that's a day that we take some time to think about these things. And it's not a memorial day. It's not a day that we look back to something that only happened one time 2,000 years ago. But it's a day that we remember that something that began 2,000 years ago is still happening today. And what is that? That Jesus saves, that the Holy Spirit fills our lives, and that we are saved and transformed by God. And this filling of the Holy Spirit, this presence of the Holy Spirit, this God with us and in us, is something that we love in the vineyard. We love the ministry of the Holy Spirit, his power, his closeness, his comfort, his living in us, his baptizing us and covering us. We just love that God is present and active and powerful in and through us by his Holy Spirit. And so tonight we're going to hear about the good news of um, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's going to be presented to us by Eleanor Mumford. Eleanor was one of the pioneering leaders of the vineyard in the UK, along with her husband, John. And they now are part of heading up the Vineyard Global Initiative. And um, she's um, recorded a message for churches, vineyard churches all over the UK, for us to spend some time today listening to this. And so I just really hope that as we listen along together and we let Eleanor teach us, that you will experience the presence of God wherever you are and that he will speak directly to each one of us what we need to hear, the good news of who he is and how he can transform our lives. Over to you, Eleanor. Today we celebrate Pentecost. So let me read you the historical events of that day as recorded in the Bible at the beginning of the book of Acts. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The events of Pentecost, what actually happened, were extraordinary. Leaping flames, howling gale force winds, a cacophony of languages. These things were experienced, they were seen, they were heard, they were felt. Little wonder a crowd gathered, amazed and perplexed, we're told, asking one another, what does all this mean? You could hardly blame them for wondering if the disciples had been drinking. At which point, Peter jumps to his feet, raises his voice and begins to explain. And remember who this is. Only weeks before, this man had been cowering furtively, denying point blank that he'd ever known Jesus at all. And now, bold as brass, he preaches possibly the greatest sermon of all time. Let me explain this to you, he says. Listen carefully to what I say. These people haven't been drinking, as you suppose. It's far too early in the morning for crying out loud. So what's all this about? I think three things are going on here. The Holy Spirit was poured out. Exactly as Jesus himself had predicted in his last conversation with his disciples, when he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Pentecost is all about power. Nobody who reads these accounts could possibly doubt it. In fact, centuries before, way back in the Old Testament, this had all been anticipated. The prophet Joel had prophesied 
In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, both men and women. Samuel, the prophet, prophesied to King Saul, the spirit of the Lord will come upon you, Saul, in power, and you will be changed into a different person. And now the same Holy Spirit has been poured out unleashed in a startling new way, and so much so that these ordinary people have received God's power because the Holy Spirit has come on them. And so we have Peter changed from a coward to a champion, from a pathetic little figure to a preacher extraordinaire, and all within the course of a day. And you see, the same thing is happening even today. Lives are being transformed, bodies healed, nerves steadied, demonic powers broken, marriages rescued, families strengthened. We're hearing stories all the time about wonderful things that have been doing as the Spirit of God is poured out. A friend of mine was talking to someone on the phone recently and it turned out that this was a young nurse and she was suffering from a cracking migraine. And so of course my friend said, well let me pray for you, there and then, over the phone. And as she prayed, the headache went, her eyesight cleared, she felt fine, and she went straight back to work, back to the ward. Another occasion, a young man who was, well, really, what was it, struggling with terrible toothache, and I can't imagine anything so awful as that sort of toothache and no access to a dentist. And so this other fellow, who actually was a stranger, but he was part of the church and he was praying for this fellow over Zoom, and he said, well, do let me pray for you, which he did. And the toothache vanished in the moment. Wonderful things. Ordinary people, ordinary people praying for the sick. Ordinary people caring for the brokenhearted, feeding the poor. And now, of course, remarkably enough, thanks to the combination of the internet on the one hand and the Holy Spirit on the other, people are finding faith. People are being helped and encouraged. People are being healed. Conversations are being had with lonely people, people who would otherwise be forgotten. All thanks to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in an even new, refreshing way. And so on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out. Wonderful. Secondly, on the day of Pentecost, the gospel was preached. As so often with Christianity, Experience is followed by an explanation. They go hand in hand. And so we have Peter here beginning to preach. This brusque, uneducated, unlettered fisherman now has a new level of energy, a new ability to do things he could never have done before. And with this new power freshly unleashed upon him, he presents the crowd with the gospel of Jesus, what we sometimes call the good news of Jesus. And he does it in a way brilliantly ordered, rationally argued, masterfully presented. And I suppose that was one of the most immediate and dramatic results of the Spirit of God having been poured out. Now, essentially, Peter's sermon was all about Jesus. This phenomenal figure, this man, Jesus, who lived an exemplary life and died an excruciating death. H.G. Wells once wrote this. He said, I am a historian. I'm not a believer. But this penniless preacher from Galilee, he said, is irresistibly the center of history. Albert Einstein, whose own background, of course, was Jewish. He said this, no one can read the Gospels without feeling the presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. The Russian writer Dostoevsky, I believe, he said, there is no one deeper, no one lovelier, no one more sympathetic, no one more perfect than Jesus. And I have to tell you, I am with Dostoevsky. Peter highlighted several aspects of this man, Jesus. He spoke about Jesus and his life. He said this, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you by God by miracles, wonders, and signs, 
which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. He's talking about the historical Jesus, the man of time and place, the man whose life had been so notable to them all. And then Peter went on and he spoke about Jesus and his death, in, I might say, the most shocking terms. This man, he said, this Jesus was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. He rebukes them. He spares them nothing. He has the crowd hanging their heads in shame, and rightly so, recognizing the outrage to which they had all contributed so recently. They had offended God by slaughtering his only son just weeks before. Peter is persuading them of a brutal truth. He's rebuking them for their sins against God himself. He's appealing to them to hear him, to respond, to escape the judgment which is their due. No wonder they were cut to the heart, we're told. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter also spoke about Jesus and his resurrection. God raised him from the dead because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of the fact. Jesus' crucifixion was not a defeat, it was a victory. Because he was a conqueror, he could be the liberator. And this was illustrated, wasn't it, quite recently on VE Day, when we celebrated the Allies having conquered the enemy, the Nazis on mainland Europe. Liberation was only possible because the enemy had been defeated and victory had been secured. And in the same way, Jesus is the supreme conqueror, the supreme conqueror of death and thereby the ultimate liberator from its power. And so it was only at Pentecost that Peter was given the power and the ability to explain the real meaning of Easter, the resurrection of Jesus, what's been described as a robustly bodily event, leaving a definitely empty tomb behind it. And having raised him from the dead, more than that, God exalted him, lifted him up, raised him to his right hand on high, the position of ultimate absolute authority. One of the early Christian um, figures, an early church father, as they call them, was a man called Athanasius, and he lived and worked in the fourth century. And he wrote this, if we were to try and number the achievements of our saviour, it would be like gazing over the open sea and trying to count the waves. And I think that's what Peter's doing here. He's numbering the achievements of our Saviour. But you know, there was still more. Peter goes on to explain that it was Jesus who has sent the Holy Spirit. It says, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and here. In light of all that Jesus was and did, is and has done, in light of the fact that it was all at the Father's instigation, according to his purposes, his foreknowledge, his, if you like, forward planning, in light of it all having been through the power of the Holy Spirit, in light of all this, given all this, Peter's conclusion then rings out. Therefore, he says, therefore, be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. It's the preaching of all time. That God raised Jesus powerfully from the dead, establishes that he is the one true Lord and King, over all and for all time. The gospel is the good news of the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God, which was supremely established in the coming of Jesus, who lived and died, was raised, who now reigns at the right hand of God, from where he has poured out the Holy Spirit. 
So, on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit was poured out. On the day of Pentecost, the good news was preached. And here's the third thing. On the day of Pentecost, the church was born. The church was born that day as a result of the Spirit having been poured out and a direct result of the gospel having been preached. As people heard it all explained, we would say that the Spirit of God fell on them and they realized the enormity of their need. They realized they were in dire straits and they were cut to the heart. And their cry was, what hope have we got? What hope is there for us? What on earth shall we do? And Peter's reply was, of course, life-changing for the 3,000 people who responded on that day alone. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, isn't it? And it's very clear in Peter's sermon that coming to Christ, putting your faith in Jesus, putting your trust in him for all time and receiving his Holy Spirit, they go hand in hand. One just doesn't happen without the other. And as all those people repented, as they acknowledged their sin, as they recognized their need for saving, as they received forgiveness for all that was past and hope for all that was to come, as they turned away from their old way of life and began to identify with a new community of believers and indeed adopt a fairly radical lifestyle, so the church began. The church was born. It was a pretty subversive, dangerous thing to do if you were a Jew living under Roman occupation. And you'll remember Peter said, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And it remains a brave thing to do not just to swim with the stream, not just to go with the flow, but to repent, to turn around, to go in another direction, to humble oneself, to face up to sin, to admit one's need, to sign up and to join in. But the rewards and the repercussions, I have to tell you, are without measure. To believe and to belong, oh, it is just such a relief. And not least during these most disorientating of times. There's everything to live for. There is such freedom to be lived in. And what Paul wrote to the Philippians is so true. For me to live is Christ. To die is gain. And how fascinating is it that when Peter goes on to describe the new community, the church as we know it, it has a community whose life is organized, not around political power or military might imposed from above, not around violent revolution brought around from below, no. But it's a community based on love for one another. That was the most distinguishing characteristic of the church as it began. And some of the earliest onlookers were recorded as having observed, see how these Christians love one another. And that's supposed to this day to be the chief characteristic of the church. Men and women from all over who are drawn together by the person of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of the Father to love one another. They became a community around whose life was, was um, shaped around a very different way of doing things, a very different pattern. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. And we're told that as the church, as these new believers gathered together, as they lived this life, they praised God. They worshipped him. They had everything to praise him for. They enjoyed the favour of the people. And the Lord added daily to their number, those who were being saved. And we might go on to say he's been doing so every day since then. So do you see, Pentecost is a great day. It's a great day to respond to Peter's explanation of the gospel, how Jesus saves and transforms us, how he can forgive us our sins and set us free, how he can give us everything to live for and indeed to die for. It's a great day, as it were, to buy in 
maybe for the very first time, and to become a part of that new community of believers we call the church, to enjoy the benefits of believing and belonging. And of course, it's a great day to be filled yet again with the power of the Holy Spirit. D.L. Moody was once asked whether he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, he said, but I leak. Every day, many times a day, we can come to the Lord and ask to be filled with the Spirit. We can be enabled, we can be empowered yet again to live life to the full. Because we remember what Jesus said. He said, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? And what better day on which to do that very thing than now, as we celebrate the day of Pentecost. And now as we finish off, I'd love to suggest that we might pray together for a few moments. And although this seems a very strange way of doing things, and it's not quite as we're used to, I have been amazed over the last few weeks at the remarkable way in which God does still come. He does pour out his Holy Spirit as we pray for one another. And so I would love to do that even now. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come. So precious, wonderful Holy Spirit, who we're celebrating today on the day of Pentecost, come Holy Spirit. This is the oldest prayer of the Christian church, and we pray it again today together. Hundreds of us, who knows how many of us, and who knows where, all over the place, every one of us known to and loved by the Lord himself. We pray at this very moment, Lord, would you come? Holy Spirit, please, would you come? Would you come and bless your people? Every one of them. Some in little groups clustered around a screen. Some of you on your own, in your own room. At one level, it matters not. Holy Spirit, will you come? Will you be our comfort, our companion, our everything in these moments? And I'd love to, um, I'm going to pray one particular prayer, if I may, because I think there are people who may well have felt they've heard for the first time what the gospel of Jesus means. What is the good news? What does it mean to me? And there's no day better than to invite Jesus to be a part of your life from now and forever. I mean, what a historic day that would make this one. And so I'm going to pray as we recognize our need for a savior, the fact that he is the savior, and the fact is that he wants to be your savior. So I'm gonna pray in the first person because it feels kind of natural. And if this is what you would like to echo in your heart or out loud, who cares? God knows, then let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for who you are and all that you've done. I thank you that you are indeed the savior of the world who went to the cross and who died, that my sins will be forgiven and I could be set free. I recognize my need. I recognize so much that I regret. I recognize my need to repent and turn round and ask you from this day forward to become a part of my life. Lord Jesus, would you come into my life and would you fill me, as you have said, with your Holy Spirit, giving me everything to live and to die for from this day forward. Amen. Amen. Wonderful prayer to pray. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to carry on, to carry on what you're doing. And Lord, even as we've talked about them, we pray for these physical things that are afflicting so many people during this time. We pray for people with that um, tendency to migraine. We pray for people who have headaches even now. We pray for people with toothache. We pray for those with aching joints from not having been out and about, not having done as much as they would normally do. I pray for people who are struggling with, with skin conditions. 
sometimes brought on just by being nervous or, or, or anxious, but physically manifested on your skin and causing you irritation and distress. Lord Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit, in this moment, I pray for that power to come on those bodies. We break the power of headaches, the power of toothaches, the power of aching joints, the power of in, uh, the, the, the affliction of irritations on the skin. By your Holy Spirit, given your power, would you come and do these things and bring relief and healing right now. And Lord, I pray too. I pray for those who are struggling with inner stuff, deep anxiety, real distress, awful grief, not knowing what's going to happen next, financially stressed, emotionally stretched to the nth degree, struggling with all sorts of things we could never have imagined or anticipated in these days. Holy Spirit, you are not confounded. Loving Heavenly Father, you know just what's going on with us. Lord Jesus, you're right here in the middle of everything with us. Would you make your presence known in these moments? Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. And may the peace of God, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, it's beyond being rational, it's beyond being natural, it's be beyond being expected or drummed up. It's the peace of God, and it passes all understanding. May it keep your bodies and your souls, your hearts and your minds, every part of your being in the love of God. And Lord, may we just pray together the blessing, may the blessing of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you on this wonderful day of Pentecost and well beyond it. And all the people, wherever they are, said, Amen. Amen. Oh man, wasn't that great? Wasn't that good news? No matter who you are, where you've come from, where you've been, what you've done, today is the day that God can transform your life, that Jesus can save you from your past and that you can be totally transformed from the inside out by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And I just get a sense as we were listening along there that there are many of you who have experienced the spirit where you are. Maybe you um, are getting the sense that you just want more of God in your life. And maybe you're one of those people who, for the first time tonight, you've heard the good news of how God changes lives. And you prayed that prayer along with Eleanor to invite God um, into your life, to be the Lord of your life and to give your tomorrow, all your tomorrows, to following after Jesus. We would love to pray with you tonight. We'd love you to let us know um, that you did that and there'll be a little um, button at the bottom that you can press that, to say, I think it has a little hand raised thing to say that, yeah, I gave my life to Jesus. Um, also, we'd love to pray with you if you um, experienced the Spirit tonight and you want to just kind of seal that. Um, or you need something, maybe you need healing, or you need peace, or you need um, to hear God's voice. We would love to pray with you. We believe the Holy Spirit is here right now where we are. And so again, there's a little prayer button if you're watching on our church online. There's a little button at the, at the bottom there that says live prayer just underneath the screen. And if you click on that, uh, a private chat will open with one of our prayer team who would love to pray along with you. I'm thankful. That the power and presence of God is not stuck somewhere in the past, but he is present here right now with us. Let's just pray together as we go. Lord, I just thank you for tonight. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here now. You're our comforter and our friend. You are the transforming presence and the power that we need to live this life in relationship with God and I just ask you to fill each one of us anew 
tonight. Would you come, Holy Spirit, to every living room, every bedroom where people are listening to this, every home, and would you make your presence known to us and speak to each of us exactly what it is that we need to hear. And I pray this in your name. We'd love to pray with you. So click that live prayer button. Also, we are here every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. for Church Online, where we're in this lockdown period. So we'd love for you to join us. Come back and visit us again. And you can also find out everything about Falkirk Vineyard um, at falkirkvineyard.com. You can get in touch with us and find out more about what it is that we do. Um, so go and visit that. All right. Thank you for spending this evening with us. We love you. God bless you.